Please uh, make your way to your seats. We will uh, resume then with uh, goal area four, uh, which is focused on every child lives in a safe and clean environment. So we're going to have one combined presentation by Kelly, our Chief of Water Sanitation and Hygiene. And she's going to be looking at elements that cross, cut across water sanitation and hygiene, which is the, the heart of goal area four, but also areas around disaster risk reduction, around uh, climate and climate change adaptation. So it really brings those areas together uh, with a specific look on making sure that every child lives in a safe and clean environment. With that, Kelly, over to you. Great, good afternoon. Thanks uh, so much for being here. Um, and I'm really happy to be kicking off um, the afternoon talking about such an important uh, subject, um, which is that children live in a clean and safe environment. And I think this, you know, really comes out in uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, embedded in Article 24, that um, a clean and safe environment are really determinants of children's health, education, nutrition, gender, equality, and safety. Um, so we're really happy to be able to bring these kinds of important issues into our strategic plan, um, especially at a time when the, the environment is under threat uh, more than ever. And last year alone, there were 281 uh, climate and geophysical related events that affected more than 60 million people around the world, over half were in India. So we can see the scale of the challenge. So goal area four um, is our attempt in the strategic plan to really articulate UNICEF's commitment to environment and the resiliency agenda as part of Agenda 2030. So this uh, goal area is really um, looking at how we uh, bring in goal area, SDG goal area, uh, goal six um, on clean water and sanitation. On SDG goal 11, sustainable cities, goal 13 on climate action, the Sendai framework, um, and of course underpinning these are goal 5 on gender equality, um, goal 1 on ending poverty. Um, the way that our goal area is set up um, has five different output areas. So two you'll be quite familiar with, um, which are kind of uh, traditional areas of UNICEF programming, which are uh, goal, uh, the first output area is water, the second is sanitation, um, and then we have new areas, which are disaster risk reduction, which covers not only risks of disasters, also conflicts, public health emergencies. Um, many of us have, are aware of the cholera and Ebola uh, epidemics. Um, also looking at children in urban settings, um, which is not new for UNICEF, but coming now um, into focus. Um, and then also um, environmental sustainability, which includes also uh, climate change. So when we're going to talk about our results, um, they're going to be uh, building around these uh, areas. So the global context um, is essentially, um, I mean, many of us know, and you may have seen the, the UN Secretary General's unedited report that came out um, that tells us that one third of the world's population still lacks access to safe drinking water, and two thirds lack access to safely manage sanitation. So the scale of the challenge is, is huge. Um, and uh, we know that if we're gonna achieve even universal basic access by 2030, we're going to have to double our efforts on uh, sanitation. Um, humanitarian crises are, in, are increasing in number and duration. And today, one out of four children uh, in the world is living in a country affected by conflict or disaster. Um, in urban areas, we know some, uh, some areas there's rapid urbanization that's taking place um, and unfortunately limited government resources to be able to plan or program for children in these urban settings. Um, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but UNICEF released um, an important report last year that talked about um, inequalities of children living in urban areas and how some of the deprivations of the poorest children in urban areas exceed those of rural areas. 
Um, lastly, just on climate change, um, today we estimate that 25% of children live in extremely high flood occurrence zones. 90% of the climate-related health effects will be borne by children. Um, and we also have an estimate that 90% of the world's children breathe air that is highly polluted. So these are some of the contexts and why UNICEF um, has prioritized these areas in our strategic plan. So now to the results. Um, so last year, um, UNICEF directly supported 18.6 million people to gain access to safe drinking water and 10.8 million people to basic sanitation. So these um, are uh, people who have been directly supported by interventions through UNICEF programs. 71 countries are undertaking uh, hand washing promotion at community level. Um, 43 million people have been reached in humanitarian responses in 66 countries. Um, and UNICEF also launched a flagship report on, um, on water under fire, which said that three times more children under 15 die from wash-related disease than from direct violence in conflict zones. So the, the situation um, of wash in fragile contexts is of particular concern, and we know that children living in fragile settings are twice as likely um, to lack uh, access to sanitation and four times as le less likely to lack access to safe uh, drinking water. So uh, UNICEF overall um, supported WASH uh, interventions in 105 countries. Um, healthcare centers, which is um, a, a new area also for this strategic plan, um, was an area where targets were exceeded. We had planned to reach 2,000 uh, healthcare facilities, but in fact, um, we reached 3,355 facilities, and this was in part due to significant efforts um, in uh, co uh, countries that had been affected by the Ebola epidemic in West Africa that are now upgrading facilities with infection prevention and control. Um, another area that went off the charts for us this year was menstrual health and hygiene, um, where we uh, supported 17,000, well, almost 18,000 schools in 50 countries um, to be able to uh, have menstrual hygiene and health promotion through the education sector. So this um, has been an area of rapid growth um, in our programming. And um, I talked about results in 50 schools, but we have over 70 school, uh, 70 countries that are engaging on menstrual um, health and hygiene, which are important both for gender, but also um, for our engagement with adolescents, both girls and boys. Um, and uh, also, um, we have another new thing we wanted to share with you, which is that we have started reporting on the sustainability of the water systems that UNICEF is building. In the past, we have just been reporting on new people gaining access to sanitation. But today, I'm proud to stand before you to say that um, we can report that 87% of the water systems that UNICEF um, has provided have been functional for at least five years. And this is coming from data in 37 countries. Um, and we are now systematically um, using sustainability checks to measure sustainability in 34 uh, countries, which exceeds our target of 18. Um, but these results um, are very much um, based on um, strengthening systems. And I think you know we report a lot on the numbers, but a lot of the work that UNICEF is doing in countries um, is building the capacity of, of institutions um, to be able to ensure uh, the scale of equity and sustainability of WASH services. Um, and we're now not limiting ourselves only to public sector, but also working with the private sector, which also um, plays a large role in the WASH sector for delivering services. Um, this uh, is a map um, of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is mapping out the availability of water resources for low-cost manual drilling, um, which is done predominantly through small and medium enter enterprises um, and can be done also with the investment of uh, local municipal funds as opposed to just large national investments. 
Um, we've also been branching into new areas. Um, one of the big challenges in the wash sector is uh, financing. We estimate that the financing gap per year is $115 billion, um, which is triple the current uh, currently available resources. So UNICEF has been working on developing new mechanisms for innovative finance to attract repayable finance to promote local investment in scaling up services. Um, UNICEF is also a leading um, agency, leading actor in the WASH sector. Um, we uh, are together with the World Health Organization. UNICEF is the co-custodian of SDG targets 6.1 and 6.2 for the global monitoring and reporting. We also host the uh, global WASH cluster. Um, we host also the Sanitation and Water for All partnership. We are the chairs of the Wash for Work partnership um, and play an active role in the regional sanitation platforms of Sakosan in South Asia, Africa San in Africa, and Latino San. Um, and uh, just this year, one of the results in these areas was the publication of the baseline uh, for the data of WASH in schools, um, which contributes not only to uh, universal access of water and sanitation at household level schools and, and healthcare facilities, which is part of SDG 6, but it also, um, looking at WASH in schools, also contributes to targets uh, 4A under um, the uh, goal 4 um, on uh, education. Um, I just did want to mention, I know there was some discussion this morning around cholera. I don't have a slide, um, but UNICEF has been actively engaged in 47 countries with um, looking at uh, cholera control through the uh, Global Task Force for Cholera Control, uh, ending cholera uh, as a roadmap to 2030. Um, UNICEF has been a major uh, responder um, in the largest responses, uh, such as Yemen, where we contributed 70% of the response for water and 96% of the response for, for sanitation. Um, in terms of long-term cholera um, work, we are working with 10 countries uh, to develop roadmaps to comp comprehensively address cholera hotspots. Um, and last year, we supported 24 countries reaching 10.2 million people um, with uh, a, a response on uh, cholera. So now I want to move into um, the other areas. So enough about WASH. Um, let's talk about the other areas of, uh, of goal four, um, which are some of the exciting new things um, in, in, the SD, in the strategic plan. Um, so this is the first year that we're going to be reporting results. So it might sound a little bit different than what I've been saying for WASH. Um, our main uh, strategies have been looking at positioning and strengthening children's issues in disaster risk reduction, peace building, local governance and urban planning. We'll come to the climate part next. Um, we've, we've, we found that one third of our country offices meet our organizational benchmarks for risk informed programming. Um, We've also um, worked um, in urban on the basis of UNICEF's 2017 strategy note, which really outlined some key areas looking at data and evidence, participation and accountability, local planning and budgeting, and local service delivery. I think there were really two main products I wanted to point out um, that came out from the work on urban. One was a statistical analysis looking at child well-being in urban areas. Is urban an advantage or a paradox? Um, and this was a deep dive into looking at how um, children in, are experiencing different uh, access to basic services um, across the sectors um, in urban spaces. Um, and we also released a handbook on child responsive urban uh, planning. So on the climate front, um, this is the first time that climate has been so prominently uh, positioned in the strategic plan. Um, we have been working very much both at uh, positioning children's issues 
um, uh, on uh, climate in global and national spaces, both climate and the environment, so bringing the voice of children to this larger uh, agenda. Um, and then we've also really been working internally in terms of anchoring uh, climate uh, sensitive uh, approaches into our core areas of programming um, across WASH, across education, across health, um, and also greening UNICEF. Um, so this has been some areas where we have been really engaged um, in direct uh, action. Um, I think another priority of UNICEF in the climate space has been really activating youth engagement. Um, there was a, a national youth uh, conference in Bolivia, which brought together children from around the country together with Mother Earth to really um, address uh, the climate issues from a youth perspective um, and also engaging youth in the global space with the uh, climate uh, superhero comic book uh, competition, um, which was launched with uh, COP23 uh, um, and led to, I understand, although I did not see, a theater performance um, of the comic book um, at the uh, Climate Week here in uh, New York. So these are some of the areas that um, that we have been uh, working on. We've also identified really four uh, priority areas for scale up um, within climate and the environment. The first one being climate resilient wash services that address both um, climate change as well as water scarcity, looking at renewable energy and disaster risk reduction in health and education systems, and air pollution monitoring and response programs. So those are the areas um, of focus within this this uh, programming uh, area. So moving into new areas isn't without um, its challenges, but I think we've chosen to do this in a, a stepwise approach, um, really to enable these new areas of work with a focus on data and evidence, a focus on developing models with countries that can be scaled up um, to be able to expand programming in these new areas. Um, looking at developing guidance um, for programming and technical tools for country offices, um, and also working together with our country program development process to be able to um, prioritize um, these new areas, disaster risk reduction, urban, um, climate, and the environment based on the relevant geographic uh, issues and sector issues a country is facing. I think the second uh, challenge that we've been really addressing is building our internal capacity to be able to deliver um, on new agendas. Um, there was a lot of training that took place this past year um, in being able to undertake uh, risk assessments, uh, to do multi-hazard assessments, to be able to get uh, right um, our programming to be able to um, manage and mitigate risks. And then I think the third thing is really looking at new partnerships. If we're going to be working um, in new areas like urban spaces, we need to be now partnering uh, with new types of partners like municipalities, um, which uh, has helps us to be able to um, work effectively um, in those environments. In terms of funding, um, we would uh, like to acknowledge that um, Sweden is the largest uh, thematic donor to Goal Area 4, um, providing uh, 51 million to WASH and over 500,000 to the Safe and Clean Environment Thematic Fund. Um, our total thematic funding is uh, 67 million um, for these both uh, funds. These funds um, have supported programming in 75 countries um, with a focus on achieving our um, SP targets, predominantly ending open defecation, achieving uh, basic water and sanitation services, menstrual hygiene management, and institutional wash in schools and healthcare facilities. Um, and we do this um, with a prioritized uh, needs assessment. 
Um, we did want to point out that this is an area where we are um, actively uh, fundraising, particularly to support um, scaling up some of these uh, new areas of programming. Um, our first year, we had um, a total budget of 912 million. Um, for WASH, this is predominantly, uh, this is about 51% humanitarian, 50% development funds. Um, our funding did go down um, from 2017 by about about 10%, and um, we're estimating a total uh, funding gap for the goal at uh, $2.9 uh, billion for the three years left in the program. So just to talk about a few of the high-level uh, priorities. So first, um, on the WASH side, um, we are working on reaching uh, the most uh, left behind while also looking at how we take up um, the uh, safely managed um, agenda to increase uh, quality and sustainability of our programming. Um, we are looking at building better capacity and predictability of our emergency responses um, and really focusing in to tackle these issues, especially on financing by developing business models that will help us to be able to attract repayable finance. Um, in the uh, resilience, urban programming, local governance, and environmental sustainability uh, focus area, we are looking at increasing capacity for risk-informed programming, looking at um, scaling up work on urban planning and budgeting across countries. We have programming guidance that's being developed by the social protection uh, section on uh, pro programming for local governance. Um, and we also are looking at developing and documenting environment and energy interventions um, that can be um, uh, you know, advanced across the organization as a whole. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, please join us on the panel, Kelly. And uh, if we could also ask some of the other colleagues uh, who are experts to come up uh, so that we can be able to address some of the questions. And let me get my stuff out of the way. Thank you, we, we've been given a bit more time by the organizers, given that we started lunch a bit late. Uh, sorry about that, Gautam. And um, uh, perhaps start by introducing yourselves. I don't know if there's a mic that can be passed around. This is called musical chairs. <laughs> Go ahead, Hamish. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hamish Young. I'm the Chief of the Humanitarian Action and Transition Section. Um, we work on risk resilience and uh, um, peace building. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Thomas George. I'm the Senior Urban Advisor for uh, UNICEF. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Gautam Narasimhan, and I help look after some of our programs related to climate change and environmental degradation. Good afternoon, my name is Maral Devine, I'm Local Governance Specialist. Thank you, colleagues. So uh, over to you, uh, colleagues, uh, for any questions, comments, questions, observations uh, on any of these areas, WASH, DRR, resilience, climate change, uh, local governance. Floor is open. Yes, please. I just said I'm happy to come from Sweden and see the thank you because I know that we are very important partners uh, in WASH. Uh, so my question is that I would like to hear more about your work with climate change because it has come up as a very important new issue for the WASH program and I think that will really be looking forward, the big challenge for us. And I also wonder how we can um, uh, interest uh, uh, the uh, the industry how to to support uh, this new very important area. Um, yeah, that's what I would like to know more about. 
Thank you very much. Yes, please. Can you pass the mic? Thank you. Hello, thank you, Anna Gren from SIDA, Sweden. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for your excellent presentation and for the report. And I want to say very briefly that we welcome the report. It was been, it has been really interesting reading it, and I have a number of comments. We'll meet uh, bilaterally later on in the week to discuss more issues. But the many results that you presented, one <coughs> very specific re uh, result in the report is um, in the context of the development and humanitarian nexus. And I want to say that I think it was very nice to be able to read that those aspects, the nexus in the in the report. Uh, and on, although the results are important, I think it's indeed uh, heartbreaking, for lack of another word, to read that 60% of WASH in emergencies appeals went underfunded in 2018. And I think in the context of global challenges in terms of environment and climate change, disaster risk reduction, and um, we might be seeing more of these emergencies around the world. And I just want to know a little bit about how you're thinking and planning and also along with all the, of the thematic areas in, in terms of going forward, uh, specifically in, in fragile settings. Um, just before I leave the mic to someone else, I want to commend you on the excellent uh, reports on uh, WASH in healthcare facilities. I think it does provide a roadmap for the world in terms of extremely relevant areas that we need to work that will affect uh, health areas and child protection and overall other work by other uh, partners around the world. And also your report on water on the fire, which also raises a number of issues that are highly relevant for other areas of UNICEF's work. I'll stop here. Thank you, Anna. Third question, yes, please. Do you want to pass the mic over there, please? Yes, thank you. It was an excellent report. And I'm particularly pleased to see that one of your four challenges is the impacts of climate change on children. I understand it's the fastest growing issue for children in the world, full stop. And yet at the National Executive Directors Conference in Florence, I asked what resource does UNICEF have dealing with climate change? Is there a dedicated team and resource? And I was told, no, there isn't. We just integrate it in everything we do. I don't think that's good enough for the future of our children. And I hope that there's gonna be a lot more resource put at this um, and showing that UNICEF is a leader in this. So I would love, I'd like to know whether that was fact or fiction. Thank you. Why don't we take those three and then we can always do uh, another round or two. Um, shall we start you off, Gautam? So first of all, thank you very much. And uh, in terms of the, the first question of, uh, as Kellyanne mentioned in her presentation, this is the first time that climate change and the environment has been featured in our strategic plan. And that is a reflection of two things. One, a clear and growing understanding that children are the most affected by these issues and that this has to be a core part of our response. But the second part of it is also an increased recognition within UNICEF that even if we haven't included it in our strategic plan, we have deep experience in the responses that children will depend upon most. When it comes to the immediate, when it comes to the immediate impacts of climate and environment, when it comes to disaster risk reduction, when it comes to programmatic implementation and to making sure that the sectors that we have deep experience in, wash, health, education, need to be made more resilient to the impacts of climate change for the intermediate impact. And finally, that we also need to address the longer term effects that this will have, whether in when it comes to peace building and ensuring that humanitarian development responses are integrated. To the question, and we have deep experience in all of this. To, to the point that you made, how can the private sector and how can we work with our private sector fact partners with the understanding that the private sector is, first of all, an increasing and growing part of all of, these, of all of these responses. And second, that they have to be a partner in this. There are a few broad areas. The first is in terms of evidence generation and evidence generation and data gathering and building the case for how all of these should be made climate resilient. I'll give you an example in terms of the work that our nutrition colleagues are doing with, with private sector partners in trying to understand and bring and really advocate for ensuring that food systems and nutrition systems 
are planned with climate change in mind, and that the private sector, which is increasingly a part of it, factors that into their decision making. Secondly, when you look at, for example, health and education, an increasing number of which services are provided by the private sector. Those also have to be made not only climate resilient, but when it comes to education, also factor in not just looking at climate and environment as a risk, but ensuring that children and young people have their share in the opportunities that occur in the growing economy for environmental sustainability. And this is where some of our Generation Unlimited colleagues are doing a lot of work. So I don't know if that starts to address a bit of your question. To the second question, in terms of, I am the worst person to ask about the level of resources that UNICEF should be putting towards climate and environment, because I will say we should be putting all of our resources into it, because this affects everything that we do. In terms of the, the, the work that we actually do, and we have a small team here based in New York with regional advisors complemented, but the answer that you, that you received is to a certain extent true in that it's climate change and environmental degradation isn't the responsibility in the organization of just a small team. It is our duty to ensure that all of our responses factor that in. Of course, help coordinated by a small team. But here, this is where I'm probably going to put Mr. Chaiban a bit on the spot and say, in terms of the resources that we're actually putting towards climate change and whether that's enough, Ted, no, it's not enough. What are we doing more? <laughs> I'm going to answer that question before you go ahead, Kelly. So let me speak to the issue of uh, climate change a little bit. And, and uh, I, think, I think Gautam is correct in all the aspects of his response. Uh, and, and again, to, to the, the chair of our Swedish uh, committee, um, I, it was interesting when we met and kind of reflected at the beginning of the strategic plan, what was going to be the big key issue that we needed to get uh, more on top of, and I say more on top of because we deal with these issues on an ongoing basis, but sometimes an issue comes and it hits a certain momentum and you need to be able to accompany it, be part of the leading of it, be part of the shaping of it. When we developed the current strategic plan, the issue that we foresaw and we really mobilized around was the issue of migration, children on the move. We just had a similar touch base three weeks ago. And it was very clear to us, and here I think in Mia Copa, that um, while we have been engaged in different ways on issues related to climate change, environment and climate change adaptation, I don't think we've done nearly enough uh, as an organization. And that really came as the most striking issue that, that we really need to look at. And I think what's important, what we're looking at with, with with Gotham and the small group of colleagues dedicated to the issue, is to identify specifically what are going to be the, the kind of programming areas of work that UNICEF has the best comparative advantage to support to take forward so that we continue to work through our existing platforms, our existing systems, our existing capacities to move things forward around that team. And so in that sense, Gotham is right. We need more resources. But it's also true that a lot of our work is going to be done through education, education as a platform, through WASH and WASH as a platform. And we need to be able to kind of continue that, that, uh, that way forward. Let me finally say, and I think this is an important uh, kind of step that we're taking as an organization. We've had a team that's focused on resilience and disaster risk reduction. We've had a small team that's focused on climate and climate change adaptation. And we're looking how to bring these two teams together so that there is a capacity that looks at uh, a climate disaster, multi-hazard disasters, but then looks at the interaction between the two. And I think that's going to be an important uh, part of the way forward, an important way to reinforce the capacity that Gautam says is needed. Back to you, panel. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, so maybe just making the segue. So one of the obviously one of the ways that climate change is felt is through water. Um, and so we have really um, I think climate is really now. I mean, it's a first thought, um, not an afterthought in our water program. I mean, we are much more um, starting uh, looking at all of our water projects with looking at the resource itself. Um, we've been um, pretty active both on the adaptation and mitigation side, on the adaptation side, very much um, looking systematically at um, monitoring groundwater, um, particularly in areas where we have concerns about over extraction of groundwater. Um, we've also been looking at deploying new techniques to be able to um, 
increase the renewable uh, res groundwater resources through um, techniques like uh, sand dams and other uh, aquifer uh, recharge techniques. Um, we've also been having to look at developing uh, new uh, methodologies for borehole siting um, to be able to tap uh, more sustainable uh, water resources. I think, you know, as Ted was saying, when we kind of scoped out the strategic plan, we really focused on part of SDG uh, 6, um, which are the parts about drinking water and sanitation. Um, but the other parts are really around um, the water resources, and we're currently working on some uh, frameworks for looking at um, also water scarcity and water demand management, um, which will be able to help us engage also um, in uh, children's issues related to the other uh, uses of, of water. Um, on the mitigation side, we've been really scaling up our work on solar uh, water pumping. Um, this is this is just a huge win. Um, I mean, when we're, we're starting to be able to, just a couple weeks ago, I was in Myanmar, um, and we are now bringing uh, household um, household uh, water to, to to household connections, um, and I mean the difference when you talk about people spending hours a day walking kilometers carrying water, and with renewable energy from the sun, people now have household taps in their kitchens. I mean this is just such a a, a gain uh, for development, and so this is really kind of the direction that we want to go with the water programming. Um, just moving on um, to the comments about the humanitarian uh, development. Nexus. Um, I, I think um, that this is another um, point that um, we absolutely have to address. And so we've developed the advocacy agenda with Water Under Fire, which really looks at three uh, key en entry points, one being linking SDGs um, and looking at how we will achieve SDGs in countries with protracted crisis um, and um, other types of recurrent disasters as, you know, requiring new ways of working um, on development. We have a second area of looking at increasing capacity um, and coverage of our emergency operations, and a third one of doing advocacy to stop attacks um, on water systems, sanitation systems, and personnel, which of course sets back uh, water access. And I was quite struck, um, there's a case study in the report about the decline in access in Aleppo, um, which is really quite uh, tragic of an area that had had quite high over 90% coverage that is now down to um, about 60%. So we need to try to bring these uh, up. So um, yeah, so I think, um, and, and really trying to bring peace building in as well um, to see that as part of the process of looking at how we work in these uh, settings. And on that note, you have to, <laughs> thanks. Um, just, uh, I, I just add a couple of points very quickly, um, picking up on, on two of the points that Kelly touched on. Um, firstly, on the humanitarian development nexus, and sometimes it's uh, referred to the humanitarian development peace nexus. Um, it, just to point out that uh, this is an area we've been working on for many years, as we're a, a, a dual mandate or a multi-mandate agency. Um, we've always been in development, we've always been in humanitarian response, um, and we've done a lot of successful programming over the years that uh, has brought the two together. Um, in our various evaluations and studies and reviews um, over the last few years, when we've looked at that, we've found a lot of good examples, um, but we've found that it's um, not been as systematic um, and consistent as we might want it to be. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we've um, over the last couple of years we've been working on a number of tools, particularly guidance on risk-informed programming, um, which very much um, brings humanitarian and development work um, together, um, and and some other uh, some other tools, um, conflict sensitivity, um, and things like that. And um, I think it's it's about just a month ago. Um, the the requirement to use this analysis and these tools um, was made mandatory for all new country programs um, via a, a, a new procedure that was issued by um, the executive office. 
Um, so that's a big step forward in terms of um, systematizing and, and bringing consistency and quality to the work that, uh, that we've been doing um, on uh, linking humanitarian and development um, and recognizing that this is building on a lot of, a lot of good examples over time. Um, the other thing I just wanted to touch on very quickly um, and pick up on what Kelly said and also Ted's point about bringing the climate and, um, and uh, the, re the resilience units together um, is that increasingly um, it's being recognised um, that there are very, very strong links between climate change and, uh, um, and conflict. And I think every, everyone knows that, um, you know, since time immemorial, um, access to natural resources has been a source of conflict. Um, and, and shifts in uh, access and shifts in availability of natural resources have, um, uh, have, have also been drivers of conflict. Um, and there are many examples of this. As the climate change changes more and more rapidly, we're going to see a greater and greater impact of um, uh, access to natural resources on conflict. Um, so it's very important that, that we be able to look at these together. Um, and just to note that uh, of, of the total um, humanitarian um, demands um, that the, uh, the world faces, not just UNICEF, um, the, the international community collectively, 80% of those are generated by conflict. Um, so if we're going to see climate change factor into that, that's an even bigger reason um, to focus on, on that interrelation. Thanks. Thank you, Hamish. Uh, Gautam, besides watch, the, we're, we're out of time actually, so just literally the elevator pitch between the second and the fourth floor of what else besides watch we would probably focus on programmatically in climate change, exactly as we discussed in that retreat. And this, perf and this leads in very well to the question that was asked about where also the private sector can help more. We see renewable energy as a golden thread that ties together our work in enabling outcomes in WASH in healthcare and in education. Well, Kellyanne has already spoken eloquently about the importance of energy and renewable energy in particular to enable wash outcomes, but more and more supplementing our work in using solar power to ensure that vaccines are kept cold. Renewable energy as a broader enabler of health outcomes, including such basic things as making sure that a health center has enough energy for mothers to give birth safely at night. And in terms of education, also ensuring that, that sustainable energy can be an enabler, for example, for internet connectivity, to ensure that children also have the ability to gain skills. Because let's face it, some of the best defenses that we can give to children in the face of a changing climate is to ensure that their water systems, their health systems, their education systems are resilient to climate change and can continue to function. And that children are not only seen as passive victims, but also given the opportunities to make their living in environmental sustainability. Thank you. Other two panelists quickly, one minute pitch. Okay, so I think um, increasingly it's recognized that local governments play a crucial role in the delivery of services, but also in terms of addressing climate change challenges in terms of um, disaster risk reduction. So um, my area of work as a local governance specialist, I support UNICEF in strengthening this engagement and I think it's really a crucial contribution to achieving uh, results for children. Thank you. Uh, last year was the first year we, our country has got into the urban program. And uh, I'm very glad to know that 72 countries have picked up urban program. Uh, the focus for us from headquarters is to strengthen these programs, to transform them from projects into programs. And for that, uh, I would like to highlight two things which we have done this year. One is to review and revise the SITAN guidelines, and an urban toolkit is now part of the new situation analysis guidelines, which will go into the country offices, and the future country program development will be based on these new SITAN guidelines. The second one is uh, rolling out a capacity building uh, effort for UNICEF staff, because you cannot look at having urban specialists all over in all countries. It's like, how do you transform programming into another context? We are good at uh, programming in rural. How can the same people start programming in urban as well? So what are the urban, uh, what is the urban context? What are the additional challenges? 
and how do you address them? So that's something which we are working on now. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the last panel, and thank you for the very uh, sustained crowd that we have here in the afternoon. Uh, we are going to move on to goal area five, which is every child has an equitable chance in life. We will have the initial presentation by Alexandra Euster, our Associate Director of Social Inclusion, and then we'll move on to our panel for your questions and discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. Goal Area 5 focuses on equity, our efforts to make sure that the most marginalized children aren't left behind. And this work contributes both to reducing poverty and discrimination and increasing participation, all of which are ends in themselves, well established in both the Child Rights Convention and the SDGs. And it also makes a clear difference in children's lives by contributing to all other rights whether that's health, education, protection, indeed WASH. So let me show you a little about how this works with some examples of our results across social policy work, as well as the cross-cutting areas in adolescence, disability, and gender, which are also covered by this goal area. And I'm going to make some reference to quantitative results too, but would be way too much to, to list. So you can find much more about the quantitative results and lots more examples in the report. So I hope that you will take a look. UNICEF's child poverty work helps countries to meet their SDG commitment to measure and to reduce child poverty. And so far, progress is fastest on measurement. 55 countries now measure multidimensional poverty and 74 measure the monetary kind while only 16 have made child poverty central to their national development plans. So guess where we're focusing now? We're shifting our attention to focus on helping countries to put that data to work. And let me give you an example of how that was done and what difference it made to the lives of the family that you see here in Georgia. So this is Natia and her family, and they live in Tbilisi in Georgia. And when Natia Sansone was born with a disability, the family's finances faltered. But fortunately, the government's social protection programs did help the family to stay afloat. How much families receive in such programs matters. And recent child poverty work undertaken by the UNICEF office in, in Georgia in 2018 ended up leading to a five-fold increase in the amount of money that such families would receive. So how did that happen? Well, there was growing concern in the country about increasing child poverty rates, despite the fact that the country had a child benefit. So UNICEF and the government teamed up and did an analysis which showed that the benefits were actually helping, but in fact, child poverty would be twice as high if the benefits weren't there. But at the same time, they weren't enough, and thus child poverty was still going up. So the resulting debate about this and the clear evidence that we had in hand led to the government's decision to increase the value of the child benefits from about $3.50, translated to US, to $18 um, a month. And that's making a difference now in the lives of 130,000 children in, in Georgia. So there's lots more examples um, in the report. I just want to quickly mention two more. One is Argentina, where something similar happened, but this, uh, and then the amount of funds that were provided, rather, the amount of funds available for the child grant program was increased. And this money was increased with, interestingly, and thankfully, the blessing of the IMF. Not always necessarily the case, but the IMF understood that the impact of the program that was being placed on, on government was such that you needed to create a floor under, um, under social spending, and this was a great place um, to start. In Iraq, some great work undertaken with WFP to support innovative approaches to measure child poverty, and then with UNHCR to help the government improve the flagship cash transfer program using multidimensional child poverty data. So what I'm trying to say 
is that this, this rather seemingly technical work ends up translating into more money in the hands of families who need it the most. And as you'll see a little bit later, it also helps ensure that money is invested in the services that such families need, giving the poorest kids a better chance of accessing health, nutrition, education, and protection services. I think it's worth mentioning that it also can simply mean more time for families to spend with their children, to get the attention and love that, that they need. And you can see that on the faces of Natya and her children here. We've already started talking about social protection a bit, but I'm going to, to talk a bit more about this really crucial area of our work and the largest area of expenditure in goal area five. And we know that social protection can make a difference today and can help um, today, but it can also help protect families against future risks especially when social protection systems are improved to respond to crises. And you may know we focus especially on cash transfers, including in humanitarian contexts, as you can see in the chart, the number of, of, um, of children reached. But our social protection work also aims to improve, uh, to improve systems overall, including programs that help families to access health care and other services. So let's take a look at how this helped to improve the lives of uh, Mariam and her family in, in Mali. Mariam uh, and her family benefit from a non-contributory health insurance program called Remed, which gives them access to a wide range of free healthcare services. UNICEF helped the government launch and develop, uh, develop and launch the program back in 2015. So why am I talking about it now? In 2018, our work helped to lead to a six-fold increase in the numbers of families who were eligible for, for Remed. Um, and while that number is still small at about 20,000 families, it is a huge difference in the lives of those families, and it continues to expand. The expansion that happened now was aimed especially at the poorest regions, including Caius, which is the region where, where Mariam and her family and the way that we did this was by helping to develop a single registry, which makes it easier to link the cash transfer program supported by the World Bank, with whom we partner, um, with Remed, with the, with the health insurance program. These links make programs more effective. You help make sure that the people who need help the most get all the services and all the supports that they need. And it's especially important in countries in experiencing conflict and fragility like, like Mali. And this is a good example of how you can access, you can help support both material needs as well as the services that families need. Let's move on now to our work on public finance. And here, I really want to emphasize that UNICEF's work is not simply about spending more. The idea is to help governments to spend smarter on children for education, for health, for nutrition, for protection, and for WASH. And it's not just about how much. It matters that that money is spent on the right goods and services and that these reach the poorest children. So here's how this worked in Cambodia in 2018. As you may know, malnutrition is a serious problem there. About a third of kids under five are malnourished, and 10% suffer from severe acute malnutrition. And while many factors, of course, contribute to this, it was clear that better managed finances for targeted nutrition programs could help. So UNICEF conducted a study collaborating with the World Food Program and the Ministry of Health, which estimated the economic burden of malnutrition at um, 266 million US dollars annually. And then we teamed up with the Ministry of Finance and did further analysis on the national expenditure on nutrition. And guess what we found? that less than 0.01%, not of the government budget, of the budget just of the health ministry, was being spent on nutrition. And that was being mostly to buy an expensive imported milk-based uh, milk protein product to, to treat severe malnutrition. But they couldn't afford to buy very much of it. It also found that the health ministry's weak budget planning capacities weren't particularly helped by the fact that finance had asked ministries to, um, hadn't asked ministries to prioritize nutrition in their budget. Um, it's a technical detail, but it matters, and that adds up to the 0.01%. So a third piece of the puzzle was a cost-benefit analysis by UNICEF and the Ministry of Health, which showed that a locally uh, produced fish-based protein was equally effective and significantly cheaper than the imported one, 
and could save the ministry up to 30% of its nutrition budget. So, okay, did all those studies sit on the shelf? Mm -mm, they didn't. Nutrition was finally designated a budget priority by both finance and health, and there was a 30% increase in nutrition allocations. The procurement of the expensive milk-based protein stopped, and the more effective locally produced uh, product was, was purchased, and they could buy much more, enough to fully meet the demand. And, and finally, that product is now being successfully distributed to the most deprived regions where the product was needed. You might not have thought that economists could do something about hungry children, but it is possible. Let me move now to disability, another crucial area of the work of Goal Area 5. Um, in 2018, amongst the children um, that UNICEF reached was nine-month-old Danilo, who you see in this photo, who lives in Guatemala City. He's here with his brothers. Danilo was born with congenital Zika syndrome and, with, um, and was with microcephaly. Danilo's parents told us that the doctor said, oh, we shouldn't get too attached to our baby. They just said he was essentially a potato, one that had been poorly cooked. Fortunately, Danilo's parents were undeterred, and Danilo now attends a center where he plays and gets therapy, and where his parents are supported to create a loving and stimulating environment for him. Part of UNICEF's overall support to the health ministry there to improve early intervention. UNICEF helps governments and communities to strengthen services to be more inclusive of kids with disabilities and to break down the barriers that create stigma and negative attitudes. We're also working to ensure that kids like Danilo are not invisible. This matters. Having the data, knowing where kids are matters. And so making sure that they're counted in demographic surveys as well as national information systems is also crucial to our work in this, in this field. So by receiving this intervention and care and support at a young age, Danilo, Danilo is far more likely to go on to receive an education and to get other services and the assistive de devices he may need as he grows older. In 2018, UNICEF provided over 66,000 children with such assistive um, devices, products that support their mobility, communication, and independence. And speaking of independence, let's move to adolescence. So what is adolescent civic engagement, and why does it matter? We find ourselves asking this question, and this has been an area that UNICEF has, has worked to engage in for, for quite some time. But it, it's clearly a sign that far more needs to be done to promote work in this area with donors, with governments, with schools, community members and parents, and even adolescents themselves. So at UNICEF, we define civic engagement as any activity that, um, uh, that adolescents may lead or become involved in that aims to improve their community, school, environment, state or, or country, um, including development of a combination of knowledge, skills, values, and motivation. So, Say hi here to Mamru. He's a 13-year-old, and he lives in Zatar camp in Jordan. Mamru noticed that his neighbor's daughter, who'd been injured in a mortar explosion, was housebound, and he wanted to help. So he took part in the Changemakers Lab, which aims to equip vulnerable youth in Jordan with the knowledge and business skills needed to design their own solutions to everyday challenges, and it promotes entrepreneurship and jobs. Mamru designed a simple wheelchair, and he hopes that it can be reproduced at a low cost. I like this story for a lot of reasons, but in particular, it shows how these equity-focused interventions reinforce one another. And I think you may have noticed that in some of the other um, stories that I've told you so far. Finally, to say, too often we hear only negative stories about um, the risks adolescents take or how they may cause problems or violence. But supporting adolescent civic engagement can open people's eyes to the immense positive energy and creative creativity that young people can bring to their communities, if only they're given the space, skills, and opportunity to do so. And finally, this slide is going very slow. I'm going to put it all up at once for you. Oops. Um, in 2018, UNICEF also put more focus on concrete efforts to support positive gender socialization, to change discriminatory gender nor norms, which we believe can then help achieve equitable outcomes across all rural areas. This involves changing norms in communities, in families, in faith-based organizations, um, and schools to value girls and boys equally and to widen the horizons of what each can do and what each can be. 
So Juan Carlos, in the picture here, lives in Cuba. He's a 42-year-old dad. Um, and he came across a program called Father from the Beginning, created by the Ministries of Education and Health with UNICEF's support. The campaign creates awareness um, amongst mothers and fathers about the rights, responsibilities, and benefits of equally shared parenthood. And I know this is particularly a nice picture to see, and unfortunately in 2019, still all too, too rare. So through this program, Juan Carlos learned about free childbirth classes he could attend with his partner, Maria, and they also found out that Juan Carlos could be by Maria's side in the delivery room when she gave birth. Once it's fully implemented, the campaign will reach the parents of over 460,000 children in Cuba. Um, so overall, in 2018, while over 100 countries are implementing programs on gender socialization, um, only 36 offices have taken this work to scale. So this is another example of where we know we've made a start, but we know that there's um, a lot of work to do. And this program, like many others that we've talked about here, involves a, a, a mix of strategies, including evidence generation, advocacy, communication for development, um, gender responsive curriculum development, and, and others. So those are all the stories that I want to tell you today before bringing up the, the panel so that you can hear from all of us. But this presentation would not be complete if I didn't give a massive thank you to the many governments um, who, and uh, multilateral organizations who have helped us to make a difference in all these areas you've seen here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, excellent. Um, I think very interesting. I think very interesting to see this presentation because in some of the discussions that we've had earlier, a lot of these themes have very much been present. The one of how do we leverage the much larger national resources to really uh, fund some of these priorities. So I think the data-driven approaches to increase government investment in some of these critical areas which Alexander highlighted, but also how do we increase the efficiency of programming so that we are actually able to do more with the same amount of financing, as was evidenced by the linkage of the cash transfer program with the health insurance. Also, interestingly, in our discussions previously today, there's been a lot of discussions um, and questions asked about how we integrate issues like gender, like disability, throughout all of our programs. So I think we've had a lot of discussions of those already, and hopefully it can have some more this afternoon. So I'd like to invite onto our panel Alex to rejoin us, uh, as well as Lauren Rumble, who is our principal advisor on gender, uh, Rosangela Berman, uh, who is our advisor on disability, and Fabio Frisca, uh, our advisor on um, adolescent development and participation. So maybe we'll all take their seats there. Do we have any questions or comments to start with from the floor? If not, we have some that were, I think, uh, came in online. Um, if you could maybe give us an example, and I think you've talked a lot about the different uh, contexts here. How does UNICEF keep a focus on addressing child poverty and discrimination in humanitarian contexts or contexts where um, countries that perhaps were stable before, but are moving into areas of increased fragility and potentially uh, a humanitarian situation. Thanks. This is working. As you can see, this is this has really been an important priority for us, um, and I think you've you've seen that in a, in a lot of the the stories that that you um, that are told, including in in the report. You know, uh, I think almost half of UNICEF's funds are now spent in humanitarian contexts. Um, this really, and, and nearly half of which children live in, in such contexts. So making sure that, um, that we invest more and, and understand how we're going to do this work there is, is critical. So for us kind of concretely, one of those areas where we're really focusing on this is social protection. Where our work on social protection is now looking at how do you make systems shock responsive so that they can respond, so that the government's own system can respond quickly in the event of, of a crisis. But we are also at the same time, there's a big switch in the international community towards using humanitarian um, cash transfers 
as a first line response, making sure that those transfers are linked up to and help to strengthen existing social protection systems is also something we've been focusing on quite a lot. There's a, quite a story about that in Yemen that you can also read about um, in, in the report. In public finance, we have an ongoing training um, for, for our staff members around the world, and this keeps coming up. So what do we need to do on public finance in humanitarian contexts? And the idea of looking at issues like contingency funding, about having budgets that are held back to respond to crisis is just one of the many ideas that has come up. But it's something that we will be exploring more and more. And finally, and before passing to the other panelists on this, because I'm sure they'll have plenty to say, um, as they should, is that I want to come back to the previous panel where my colleague Mariah, who's part of the social policy team, um, spoke to you and mentioned our work on peace building and disaster risk reduction, where we collaborate with colleagues um, across the organization, but especially with um, colleagues working on humanitarian issues. Because the work on, on local governance uh, is taken forward through our social policy, um, often through our social policy work, and involves working with these local authorities who are the ones in a position to act, and indeed in a position to identify who needs social protection to plan their budgets in ways that can best respond, to involve adolescents in peace building initiatives. So all of those are critical parts of our work. Excellent, very good. Do you wanna pass on for other comments? Yes, for the area of disability, social protection is critical too because it allows us to not only increase the, the um, or to reduce the extra cost of disability for any family, and also to provide services that normally are not available in society, in the community. For example, provision of assistive devices and uh, even access to education. We have been seeing this happening a lot in different countries. Um, even with not no conditionality, you can uh, make sure that in emergencies and in development, children with disabilities have more condition to participate in society. So we really believe that uh, a good thing that we are having now with re results on disability in 2018 is to be able to strengthen our relationship internally and externally with the governments on disability, social protection, gender, adolescence. So um, I think that we are in the right track. Excellent. Rosangela, I'm going to keep you on the spot because we had a recent discussion about how you felt that the disability programming in UNICEF was at a tipping point and that we laid a lot of the foundations and now we're really ready to accelerate and scale. Do you want to say a few words about that? Yes, we have, well, actually, from the results we got of 2018, first time that we had measurable results for children with disabilities, 123 countries reporting on disability, 59 countries reporting on inclusive humanitarian action as well, and assistive 66 million assistive uh, uh, thousand assistive devices being distributed and many results in other areas that we now can measure. We are engaging in partnerships that allow us to really start scaling up uh, work on disability. This year, 2018, we reached out to 1.4 million children with disabilities, but we can go much, much, much beyond this. And now we have the capacity, the knowledge to do so. We still need to, to build the capacity in the country level. Right now we are engaging, for example, on a global partnership on assistive te technology, meaning wheelchairs, crutches, hearing aids, etc., that can uh, take us to provide by 2013 500 million pieces of assistive devices in the world in partnership with DFID, Norway, USAID, and WHO. So uh, how to use our supply division, for example, to be able to scale up, and we have this capacity in-house. We need a bigger focus from donors to understand that that's the way to reach the most marginalized and leave no one behind. UNICEF is ready to do this, and we want to continue discussing uh, about investment in the area. Excellent. Uh, just turning back to the group here, if there's any issues or comments, questions. Tony? 
Thank you. This is um, excellent work, and we're all so interested in it. I'm just trying to understand, as a relatively newcomer, when UNICEF reports that 55 countries report child poverty, or 123 countries report with disabilities, is that a correct sum, or is that just the countries of the world where UNICEF have programmic? Because it's quite important when we talk to the media that we shouldn't forget the 40 countries who are national committees, who are all committed to these same areas and also report into Innocenti and to PFP these numbers. But I could be confused, but are those numbers excluded in this report which talks about these countries? Okay, Alex, we'll come to you. I think there was another question towards the back on the right-hand side that I would take now. Or maybe it has been answered. Okay, until I see that hand again, Alex, I'd hand over to you. Good question, and you got us. Um, you're right. Sorry? <laughs> well, what, 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 the report, what the report is saying is in the work where, um, in the countries where UNICEF is, is working, these are the numbers who are reporting this. But I want to come to you and challenge you on some of this as well, because there, at the time of the S, uh, that the SDGs were being developed, and we were looking at developing these indicators, one of the things that we found is that the numbers of the countries who were reporting on questions like child poverty or multidimensional poverty were far more likely to be program countries than wealthy countries. Um, because there has been less pressure, to some extent, on, uh, on countries who were left out of the MDGs to report. And so that is actually a challenge that we all need to rise, um, rise to. I think we all absolutely agree with you that UNICEF is a a global organization with a global responsibility, which includes all countries in the world. And finding ways to do that work together is very important. We here at the, the headquarters social policy team works closely with national committees and with the advocacy colleagues in national committees who work on some of, the, who work on some of these issues. And we do try and, and support a little bit programmatically here, but it's, it's difficult because neither we nor they are resourced to do that. Um, and to do that in, a, in, in, more, in more depth. But I think it's something that we should certainly work, uh, work to improve. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I have another question, and I think that this can um, go to uh, Fabio. What would you say in terms of, we've heard a lot of the other presentations, a much greater focus on adolescence. So what would you say has been one of the key lessons that has come out of the work in the last couple of years in terms of how we need to do better about working with adolescents to kind of bring their voice to the conversation. Thank you very much. Um, yes, definitely in the last couple of years for UNICEF, we have seen a much, much more focus on adolescents, especially with the arrival of the new ED. Uh, but at the same time, this was somehow in the air because we have seen that in general, the narrative uh, in the media with the member states and other partners focus on adolescence has been increasing impressively. Um, one thing is that we might be victim of our own success in a sense. Um, we are working a lot on adolescent participation. Um, uh, when work increases system significantly, quality might suffer. So we as UNICEF are somehow the guardian of meaningful participation mm -hmm. of, of adolescents versus tokenistic participation. So we are working a lot in trying to make sure that the quality uh, standards for meaningful participation remain high. Um, the importance of doing good on this is valid as in any other field, but with adolescent participation, it's even more important because if you don't do it right, it can actually be counterproductive with adolescents, in fact, becoming disenfranchised and even you know, developing anger vis-a-vis -vis the, the adults that are not giving them the, the, the right space that they, they would deserve. Um, another significant gap that we are encountering uh, refers to uh, availability of data, talking about data, Alexander, again. Um, there are very scarce data about adolescents. One reason is that when um, others, others than UNICEF, work on, on this age, they mostly work on youth, which is 15 to 24, while us, is we, we work on the second decade, 10 to 19, 
uh, more precisely 18, because that is when uh, the childhood uh, finishes. So available data typically uh, refer to youth. Uh, we are working on this. Um, we are developing a, an adolescent country tracker that is gathering available data on adolescents. And we are going to launch this um, before the end of the year. And that will equip country offices, countries, with the uh, 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 statistically significant statistics and, and data about adolescents. The other thing is very profound, is norm. In fact, in, in, in many societies, in all society, uh, there are norms that are not conducive to adolescent participation, that are, in fact, sanctioning adolescent adolescents uh, to participate. And within the, the category of adolescents, of course, we have a breakdown that has girls, adolescents with disability, adolescents from ethnic minorities that are suffering even more of that. Um, we are paying, so on one side, an important advocacy part on this. We are working on social norm. We heard this morning we have a C4D group, which is very, um, very eradicated in our programs and is helping um, our, our agenda on social norms. Um, and at the same time, we are having adolescents working on this themselves, because once you start giving them uh, space, they, they, they actually are working uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, very forcefully. And um, I would like to, to give an example, um, thinking about the most vulnerable adolescents with, with disabilities. So as UNICEF, we give the floor to adolescents to come up with solutions to problems that, that, that they perceive in their society. And, and we try to be very respectful of what they, they come up with. And they actually um, work, address not systematically things that affect their life, but things that affect the life of the, the most vulnerable people in their community. So very often they come up with solutions to help adolescents with disability, like in the example that was presented. Um, and, and a group that impressed me a lot came with solution for the elders. It was in a community where the working class migrated, so they were only the nephews and the grandparents, and they wanted to come up with solutions to help the elders. Um, and another very powerful thing in working with adolescents, and we'll stop there, is the multiplier effect. So when you empower adolescents to, to, to take activities, they then multiply our work. We have the example in Pakistan where you have been promoting skills for adolescents, mostly around the uh, health. And then we had the peer-to-peer -peer approach. And the multiplier was nine. So UNICEF directly addressed 4,000 adolescents, and they in turn reached 36,000 adolescents, with, which I think is quite spectacular, with meaningful participation in this case. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I wanted to also give an opportunity to other members of the panel to talk about norms and socialization. And I think we've heard in other uh, presentations about the most difficult children to reach are often the children that are not counted or are invisible. So if you could give us maybe some concrete examples, we can start with Lauren uh, and then Rosangela in terms of what's some of the work that we do around norms and socialization, in, in your case specifically uh, to address gender norms, and Rosangela in terms of some of the issues around uh, disability. Thank you so much, Megan. I don't know if you have access to the clicker, but it might be worth going to the very last slide um, that Alex presented, where we have a father in one of our uh, programs in Cuba who's benefiting and participating in a social norms program about fathers' roles in families. So let's zoom in on this case study. Thank you, Megan. Sorry, there are lots of clicks in this one. So here's John Carlos. And he's being able to really deliver hands-on care and share the burden of care work and the joy of child rearing with his partner. And this is not a possibility for most fathers worldwide or male caregivers. And why is that? Um, that's because of social norms in large part. Um, we know that these social norms start early. So if we think about the workforce where John Carlos is, was working, um, the burden of unpaid care work is predominantly shouldered by women. 76%, in fact, is what the ILO reports tell us from 2018. And these norms about whose role it is to take care of unpaid care work or child rearing starts in early childhood. We know that girls are shouldering 160 million hours more than boys in household chores. So starting very early, Juan Carlos is role, positive role modeling what it means to raise children as a male caregiver, a, be a real champion. And also we're hoping that he's going to um, more equitably distribute 
household chores within the family between males and females and in siblings. This enables girls to go to school, to enjoy their childhood, and really have more freedom in decision making. If we take that change that's happening in the, social, in the household level and expand our social norms change to the systems, we can work very practically with the private sector in workplaces. And we heard our early childhood development colleagues talk a lot about family-friendly policies. How can we work, make workplaces where we work as multilaterals, the private sector, for many of you, donors and partners, more inclusive of women, safer, free of violence and harassment, making sure there are breastfeeding rooms, issuing uh, policies about paternal leave so Juan Carlos can take that paternal leave. Um, all of that contributes to a broader and global social change movement. So starting very small, we see uh, positive social um, socialization work as a critical part of gender integration work. Without it, we can't change those harmful attitudes, beliefs, and practices that disproportionately affect girls and women. Rosangela. Thank you. Thank you. Well, stigma and, disc and discrimination against people with disabilities in general is in the center of the, the causes of exclusion and invisibility. It's present in every single part of society and it's something very difficult to address. Uh, UNICEF is in the best position and is doing already interventions, studies and interventions in communication for development to address this, but we have to do much, much more. This is in the center of our work plan this year. We are already developing a global package on communication for development to combat stigma, to address stigma and discrimination against disability. You have um, manifestations of stigma and discrimination from family level, community, every service, every uh, provider uh, in the community, even from religious leaders and etc. So uh, that's a critical aspect of our work. We have fantastic experiences already from uh, in Montenegro, for example, when a child uh, with a disability uh, engaged in a fight after being deinstitutionalized. So UNICEF work with the deinstitutionalization in the country, taking children with disabilities out of institutions and bringing them into the community, foster families. And uh, one of them were provoked by another kid in the, in the community. And uh, this generated a big media reaction of all parents wanting children with disabilities back into institutions. Mm -hmm. And this, you can imagine what was the impact of this with a big responsibility in the hands of UNICEF, who started, which started immediately to put together a social norms or um, a behavior change campaign in the country and could change the behavior of these parents in the uh, four year period from uh, zero acceptance of children with disabilities living and studying with their kids in the society to 80% of acceptance. So uh, this kind of work we need to do much more in every country and we need to build that capacity in go governments uh, partners in general in the community and in UNICEF ourselves as well. So that's a critical work that we have to do again related to disability and adolescence, gender, children and everybody. I remember short story when I got when I had my car accident I was 18 in Brazil and uh, engaged in the movement immediately there and there's a story that really marked my life that was I was walking there in Copacabana with my wheelchair pink you know all cool and um, uh, a beggar a woman lady old person begging on the streets looked at me and she said what a pity so pretty you know she wanted to say how come someone that is pretty and young can be so unfortunate in life, right? So I think that it relates to all of us in so many aspects. So she was really feeling that uh, in some way I was in a much worse position than she was. I don't know where she is right now. Mm. But, okay. Alex, do you want to comment on, on this? And then I'll come back for our last round. 
Sorry, you're going to have to remind me what the question oh, sorry, was. Sorry, we were talking about the whole socialization of uh, norms, et cetera. I think for, uh, for our area of work, a lot of it goes back to maybe, let me, let me say that the socialization actually then impacts on child poverty. Mm -hmm. So the story that, that Lauren was telling, um, for example, the stories that, that, that Rosangela is telling impact on people's ability to actually become productive members of, of society. The more people that we exclude, the less likely we are to have to see economies develop, to see them be able to, to lift all boats. This is a story that we're in a discussion that we're increasingly having with the World Bank, with their human capital initiative, um, as well as with the IMF, who are now focused more on, on social safeguards. And that's a discussion that we will continue to be having with them, um, including in a few weeks' time when the ED addresses the IMF board. Um, it, this is a, it's an example of how all of these areas are, are interrelated. I, I struggled for a moment because our specific work on social protection, our specific work on child poverty may not take on those issues so directly, and yet those issues impact on the, the success of the overall outcomes that, we are, um, that we're trying to bring about. I mean, of course, social protection work does as, as well, maybe just to, to briefly mention that an important part of our social protection work is to link these cash, most of social, the, the vast majority of social protection interventions that one thinks of are about income replacement kinds of, of benefits. But there's also work that connects people to services, and that includes social welfare services, includes the opportunity to, um, to be able to, to have access to, to social support. Those support services then, then help make the possibility for, for different gender norms. One of them, maybe the last one I'll mention, perhaps the most concrete is around childcare. Um, we see that the expansion of uh, access to childcare as an integral part of successful social protection initiatives um, around the world. And that in itself will both help with the social protection economic side of things and of course help with positive socialization. Excellent, thank you. A last round of questions. Any questions from the floor? I can stand here uncomfortably until we have a question from the floor. I'm brave. Okay, fair enough. Um, right, then I will uh, close out this. I think a couple of very interesting points of discussion that have come out and, and important to reflect upon in terms of the universal agenda of the SDGs. And so all of these issues in terms of child poverty measurement being important to be reflected on both for countries that are developing, but also for industrialized countries. And I think an important um, point that was made on participation, but also in terms of socialization and norms, is that those, um, for instance, adolescent participation can then become a driver of those priorities for adolescents. And we had a discussion a couple of sessions ago in terms of climate change. And we really are seeing when the voice is being given to adolescents that they are then part of the galvanizing force to really bring more focus on, on climate change. So I wanted to thank all of the participants for uh, this panel, and also just to emphasize that the data and the case studies that have been put together in these reports, I think reflect the work of UNICEF, but also reflect the work of the governments and national committees that are, that are here today, as well as many others. And so what we want to do as a next step to this area of work is really to be able to package the information in terms of the results that have been achieved, because we know that you all have constituencies in terms of your general public, in terms of your parliament, and they all have an interest in understanding how um, aids, uh, aid and uh, the pursuit of child rights can be done in a way that's efficient, in a way that shows results. And so we're committed to making sure that you have those materials um, and products to be able to continue to engage in that dialogue with the constituencies that you have back home that are important to furthering this agenda, both in terms of advocacy to keep these issues on the agenda, as well as in terms of resourcing to continue the progress, but also to address some of the gaps that have been identified. I am told that we have coffee. Thank you. <laughs>